Okay, we're in the book of Revelation. We're going to go back to Daniel this morning. Just, I don't know how much that we'll get to cover. Uh, they're passing out the papers right now. Probably won't get to those this week, but I want you to have them. And we'll definitely get to them next week. Uh, unless something unforeseen happens today, which I don't foresee in the unforeseen future. So, so anyway, thank you. Thank you for that. You remember when we started the book of Revelation? I brought to you five keys. Five keys for understanding the book. And the third key was to look for your verbs is and are. And, and we saw this come into play when we were in chapter 12. Uh, in verse 9, he talks about this great red dragon. And then he tells us there that the great red, great, the great red dragon is who? <coughs> Satan, the devil of old. He's been using this term, and all of a sudden he comes down, and you pay attention to the verb. It is. Satan, the serpent of old, who is a devil. Well, now we're up here in chapter 17. There's a great, uh, there are, well, a, a great harlot, this woman. And she's beautiful as a way she addresses herself, adorns herself, you know. And also chapter 17 begins to speak about this beast that we saw come up out of the sea. Well, if you look real quick with me at 17.3. <clears throat> and he carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness. And I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast full of blasphemous names, having seven heads and ten horns. So he sees this woman and she's sitting where? She's, she's, sitting, she's sitting on a scarlet beast. All right? And the unique thing about this beast is what? Now, this is going to come into play. We need to look at it again. What's unique about the beast? Seven heads and ten horns. Also, if you look back at verse 1. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and spoke with me saying, Come here, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters. Well, she's sitting on a beast, but what else is she sitting on? Many waters. Come down to verse 15. And he said to me, The waters which you saw where the harlot sits, these are. Peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. What are the waters that she sits on? Okay, that's a good way to say it. They're just other nations. She is over the nations of the earth. She sits on those. Look at verse 18. The woman who you saw is... The great city which reigns, present tense, over the kings of the earth. And who would that be? That's Rome. Rome is the only great city that reigns at their day and time. He presently reigns over the kings of the earth. And so now that we know that, well, there's this beast with seven heads and ten horns. Let's look at that beast right quick. We'll see what, what he's about. Uh, look back at verse 9. Here is the mind which has wisdom. He's going to tell you what this is. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. So this, this beast had these seven heads and what do they represent? 
seven mountains. We're talking about a geographical location. Rome is the only city that sat that was built on seven mountains. They knew it. And so he gives this geographic location that she sits on these seven mountains. But look at verse 10. There's a dual meaning here. And they are seven kings. Five have fallen. One is. The other has not yet come. And when he comes, he must remain a little while. So, what else does the seven heads represent? Seven kings. What about these seven kings? What do we learn? Five have fallen. They're no more. Half. There's your, there's your verb. The other, that'd be number six, has what? No. One is presently. And what about the other? He hadn't got there yet. And when he comes, how long is he going to be around? If not very long, just for a little while. Verse 11. The beast, which was and is not, is himself also an eighth. An eighth what? He's an eighth king. And is one of the seven, and he goes to destruction. So guess what we got here? The beast. The beast was at one time in the past. What about presently? He's not. He's not in power at the writing of the book. But what, what else about it? He's an eighth king, but he's one of the seven. We're going to see this come up in Daniel. He's one of the seven. How long is he going to be around again? What's going to happen to him in the end? He goes to destruction. Know ahead of time that when this beast comes, his fate has already been determined. Verse 12. The ten horns which you saw are ten kings who have not received a kingdom but they receive authority as kings with the beast for one hour, a very short time. I want you to pay attention to these ten horns because Daniel's going to talk about ten horns and he's not talking about these ten horns because these ten horns are who? They're kings, but what do they not have? Authority. Yeah, they don't have authority. They, they don't have a kingdom. So they're not ruling over the face of the earth. They're just kings in other provinces that this woman that sits on this beast, that she sits on all these many waters, they're under her. And so they throw their lot in with the beast and say, hey, you know, tell us what to do, we'll do it. He's over all of them. And so all of this comes to one thing. God versus all the world power. God's going to rule over Rome, who rules over the world at the writing of this book. But God says, hey, I'm inviting them to come together because I'm going to war with them. And guess who's behind this whole situation? The dragon, Satan, the devil. The war is going to be between God and Satan. And Satan is using world powers to get his work done. And to kill the saints. And to make sure that the world worships and honors him. Look right quick back to chapter 11, verse 15. This will play a part too. Hey, Brad, yes. Before we turn, I'm still stuck on stupid. What is, he's also one of the eight and one of the seven. Or he's also an eight and he's one of the seven. How does he be? 
Okay, now, Jer for your sake, Jer we went through that last week. If you, if you, okay, he's an eighth king, but he's one of the seven. Remember, one of the heads had been fatally killed. You know, he's killed. That left six. Now, when he gets there, he's the seventh. He's actually an eighth, but he took the place of the one that had the fatal wound. So he's he's part of the seven. Does that help? A little bit. A little bit. Okay. We'll we'll see this play out more uh, as we continue in chapter eleven, verse fifteen. At the writing of this book, this is the seventh trumpet. The seventh angel sounded. There were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. What do you see? Back here in this day and time, what came? The kingdom of the Lord. And the kingdom of the Lord rules the world. They're not ruling. He's ruling and he put the Christ, he's, he's over this whole thing. So the kingdom of, of God has already come. And just for your sake, I'll throw this in as a little tidbit. Everybody keeps talking about Jesus going to return and he's going to establish his kingdom on the earth. Guess what's already here? The kingdom of God. When Jesus came, walked on this earth, you know what he began to announce? Kingdom of God's at hand. It's here. He was the one that was ushering it in. Now this is going to play an important part in Daniel also. Okay, now we got through that. Come back with me to Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2. Daniel's going to speak to a lot of this. I'm hoping I can explain it well enough to keep you from getting confused about Revelation 17. Because some things are going to look like, and one of them is going to be those ten horns. You're going to think, oh, that's the ten horns. No, it's not. Those ten horns in Revelation 17, they were ten kings, didn't have a kingdom. So they won't be one and the same. In Daniel chapter 2, the book of Daniel um, in 605 BC, King Nebuchadnezzar brought the Babylonians down uh, in, into, into Israel, into Judah in particular. And they took away all the, the bright, smartest, strongest young men. That was the first way. But they didn't destroy Jerusalem. That was just the first attack. Then in 597, and by the way, that first way, Daniel was the one taken. In 597, just a few years later, Babylon came sweeping down again. And they did the same thing, and they took things. Ezekiel was taken in the second way. And then in 586 B.C., Babylon came to Jerusalem for the third time and utterly decimated it. And killed a lot of people, took people captive, you know, uh, and it, it was over. Well, when Daniel was taken captive in that first way, God had always promised that there would be one from the throne of David to sit on his throne and he would rule forever, which would be Jesus. Jerusalem is destroyed. That's where God's name dwelt. Jerusalem was destroyed and what would you be thinking if you're one of the people of God? And But God promised that there would be an heir of David sitting on the throne. And now Jerusalem's destroyed. What would it look like to you and to me? Yeah, kind of hopefully that God lied. Why in the world would he destroy when he said he would, he would put a person, he would put a king from David's lineage. Well, the book of Daniel is written to show God's people. God did not 
he was not unfaithful. He kept his word. He did what he said he was going to do. They went into captivity for one reason. They were ungodly. God's people can become ungodly. It's happened all through history. Well, here's Daniel. He's been made kind of a high up. Nebuchadnezzar, King Nebuchadnezzar liked him. And he's really going to like him now. Because Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. And none of the king's smart men could interpret it. And they said, hey, there's a fellow over here, Daniel. Daniel's a teenager. He said, he knows mysteries. Nebuchadnezzar, bring him in. And he's going to tell him what his dream means. And you know what's even more amazing? Nebuchadnezzar does not tell Daniel the dream. He's checking on Daniel out. We'll find out. Just find out who you are. I'm not going to tell you. Look down at verse 28, chapter 2. Well, I get the I, I do this better. Page and stuff. 28. However, there is a God in heaven who reveals mystery. And he has made known to the king to King Nebuchadnezzar what will take place in later days. This was your dream and the visions of your mind while on your bed. Now he's about to tell him the dream and Daniel doesn't know it and Nebuchadnezzar hadn't told him. Let's move on down and save a little time. Verse 31. You, O king, are looking, and behold, there was a single great statue, that statue which was large and of extraordinary splendor was standing in front of you, and its appearance was awesome. The head of the statue was made of fine gold, and its breasts and its arms of silver, its belly and its thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. That's the statue that Nebuchadnezzar saw and Daniel explains him. This is it. Look down right quick at verse 34. You continued looking until a stone was cut without hands and it struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and crushed them. There was a stone man had nothing to do with. And that stone's where? What happens? It hits the feet of this statue and the statue comes tumbling down. Verse 35. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed all at the same time and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them was found. But the stone that struck the statue became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. What was unique about this stone that crushed the feet of this statue? You take out the feet, you take everything. What was unique about that stone? It became a mountain. It became a great mountain, and guess what it did? It filled the whole earth. Now that's what we've got in the vision, or in the dream. Verse 36. This was the dream. Now we will tell its interpretation before the king. So what are we about to get? Let's find out what this is about. Here's the interpretation. Verse 37. You, O king, King Nebuchadnezzar, you, O king, are the king of kings to whom God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power, and the strength 
and the glory. And wherever the sons of men dwell, or the beasts of the field, or the birds of the sky, he has given them into your hand and has caused you to rule over them all. You are the head of God. Notice what King Nebuchadnezzar had to hear about himself. How did he get his kingdom? How did he get his power to rule the earth? God gave it to him. And God even gave him the ability to rule the birds and, and the beasts of the field. God's got control of this whole thing. Continue on. And you can see he's speaking a lot of this just like the book of Revelation. It's going to be taught a whole lot like it. Verse 39. After you, there will arise another kingdom inferior to you. What's coming after Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon rules? There's coming another kingdom. Is it going to be quite as strong a kingdom as, as Babylon? No. But you know what? This second kingdom, that's the Medes and the Persians. And Daniel's going to tell us that. He'll call them by name. But let's keep moving. And you know what? Well, let's just 39. After you, there will arise another kingdom inferior to you. Then another third kingdom of bronze. See, that's what was on this statue. Which will rule over all the earth. That third kingdom, that's Greece. And they had not come into power yet. And what I want you to know in class, how much does God know about the future? We need to see that God's got this whole thing under control. I'm telling you, King of Babylon, you got there because I gave you there. I'm telling you, this second kingdom coming up is going to be the Medes and the Persians. He's going to tell them in chapter 8. We won't, we won't go there. But in chapter 8, he calls them by name. And then there's going to be a third kingdom. And it's going to be Greece. And this is going into the, into the future. Latter days from then. And so I'm trying to get us to recognize, while I say it all the time, everybody runs around, what's happening in this nation, what's going, well, what do you need to know? God rules it all. And these other, two, these other kingdoms that were coming in, God will rule them too, because he spoke it in advance before they ruled to let you know he rules it all. Keep going. Verse 40. Then there will be a fourth kingdom as strong as iron. Inasmuch as iron crushes and shatters all things, like iron that breaks in pieces, it will crush and break all these pieces. This fourth kingdom is going to be stronger than the previous three. Continue. Verse 41. And that you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, it will be a divided kingdom. But it will have in it the toughness of iron, inasmuch as you saw the iron mixed with common clay. This fourth kingdom, that's wrong. That's wrong. Daniel is being told this 550 years before Jesus is even born. And you don't think God's got control of the earth and the kings and everything? Oh. And he's telling Nebuchadnezzar, this last kingdom, it's going to be of iron, but it's going to have clay mixed in it. So it's going to have some weakness. His weakness are going to be in the feet. Uh, verse 43. And in that you saw the iron mixed with common clay, they will combine with one another in the seed of men. But they will not adhere to one another 
even as iron does not combine with pottery. So what's the defect in this fourth kingdom, this Roman kingdom? It doesn't combine with clay. Yeah, yeah, it, it doesn't adhere together. Because iron and pottery won't adhere. But boy, it is, it is a tough one. Verse 44. In the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. And that kingdom will not be left for another people. It will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms, but it itself will endure forever. Now, what did we read just a moment ago in Revelation 11? We got the kingdom God established as king, as Lord Jesus over all the earth, and it's going to be an eternal kingdom. And he said, that's what's going to happen under this fourth kingdom. And that's when it came in under Roman rule. And God's kingdom is going to last forever, as you said. Well, let's just keep moving. Look at... Uh, I got a thought. Got a thought. Do you realize that since the fourth kingdom Rome ruled, there has never been another world ruler? There have been attempts. Even the United States doesn't rule the world. There has never been another rule over the earth. When Rome fell, it was the last. There were four kingdoms. And that's all that there would be. Every time we've seen, you know, in, in our past, someone tried to take over the rule, what happened? That's what Japan tried to do. They want to rule the world. What happened? Yeah. Germany. They wanted to rule the world. What happened? Yeah. There is a God that rules and he has a kingdom. It's his kingdom. And his kingdom reigns on this earth. And all mankind is under his rule forever and ever. And no one's got to say so about that. Come over to chapter 7. Yes. England wasn't considered a No, sir. Nope. They didn't rule all the nations of the world. They didn't rule all the nations. They, they may have had a partial, but not all. Babylon, the Medes, Persians, Greece, Rome, they ruled every nation on the face of the earth. That's why we read back there a while ago about these ten kings in Revelation. There was these ten kings, they don't have a kingdom. They don't rule. They're just throwing their lots in with the, with the beast, who's an eighth king, but one of seven. Okay, let's continue. Chapter seven. Now, the unique thing about Daniel seven, this is 52 years later in the book of Daniel. Now Daniel is going to be given a dream. And see what it means. <clears throat> king Nebuchadnezzar is dead. There's a new king ruling in Babylon. And it's Belshazzar. That's who he is. He's the new king. Continue. Verse 1. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel saw a dream and visions in his mind as he lay on his bed. Then he wrote the dream down and related the following summary of it. Daniel said, I was looking in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of the earth were stirring up the great sea, and four great beasts were coming up from the sea, different from one another. Now, this sounds a whole lot like Revelations written down. But he's telling you, this is the dream I saw, and what came up 
out of the sea. Four great beasts, and they're all different. Verse 4. The first was like a lion and had the wings of an eagle. I kept looking until its wings were plucked. And it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a man. A human mind also was given to it. Now he's not telling us what it means. This is what he saw. So here's the first beast like a lion. But he had intelligence. He was standing like a man. Continue on. Verse 5. And behold, a, a second, excuse me, and behold, another beast, a second one, resembling a bear. And it was raised up on one side, and three ribs were in its mouth between its teeth. And thus they said to it, Arise, devour much meat. Here's this third one. Or the second one, I'm sorry. And he's got three ribs and he's raised up. I'm going to tell you ahead. This is the kingdom of the Mede Persians. Medes were a little weaker. Persians were the strongest. And so you see him raised up. And he's got three ribs in his mouth. And told to devour. Let's keep going. Look at verse 6. After this, I kept looking. And behold, another one like a leopard, which had on its back four wings of a bird. The beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. This dominion came from four heads. The point being of all of this, this is Greece. It was the weakest of all of them. But it was given dominion. Let's keep moving. Verse 7. After this, I kept looking in the night visions. And behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrifying and extremely strong. And it had large iron teeth. It devoured and crushed and trampled down the remainder with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it. And it had ten horns. Now, I'm letting you know that's not the ten horns in Revelation 17. Those are the kings that didn't have a kingdom. This fourth beast that was strong and devouring, it had ten horns. Let's see what it means. Verse 8. While I was contemplating the horns, behold, another horn, a little one, came up among them, and three of the first horns were pulled out by the roots before it. And behold, this horn possessed eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth uttering great boasts. There's four kingdoms to rule on the earth. He's stuck on this fourth kingdom. And what is he stuck on about this fourth kingdom? These ten horns. What came up? It came up another little horn. That would make how many? Eleven horns. What was unique about this eleventh horn? He had a mouth on it. Boasting. Yeah. Eh? Speaking, uttering great boasts. You know. Let's keep going. We'll let him tell us what it is. Verse 9. And keep in mind. That one little horn. Subdued. And it pulled out three of the horns. Now. Real quick. How many you got left? Eight. There's eight. Now these horns are the horns that's spoken of in Revelation on the beast. That those horns that, that are, excuse me, the heads, sorry, the heads that represented, oh, oh, oh. 
we'll run out of time. Well, let me back off of that because I'll start back there explain next week. Verse 9, let's get on through this. I kept looking until thrones were set up and the ancient of days took his seat. His vesture was like white snow and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was ablaze with flames. Its wheels were a burning fire. A river of fire was flowing and coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands were attending him and myriads upon myriads were standing before him. The court sat and the books were open. Now who would this be talking about first? Talking about, yes, we're talking about God. And now, here he is. It's time to render a court judgment. And the books are open. That's the picture. Verse 11. Then I kept looking because of the sound of the boastful words which his horn was speaking. He couldn't get away from it. This guy's over here mouthing off all the time. We can't even get through a vision because he's, he's yammering. And so now he, he's, he's, he kept looking because that little horn, what's this about? I kept looking until the beast was slain and its body was destroyed and given to the burning fire. There were four beasts representing four kingdoms that would arise on the earth. What's going to happen to the fourth kingdom there in verse 11? Yeah, what's going to happen to that little horn? It's going to be destroyed. It's going to be slain in this whole thing. And so here's Daniel showing these four kingdoms. You got these ten horns. One eleventh come up. He's mouthing off. I had enough of you. I'm going to destroy you. That's the point. Let's keep moving. We'll get, we'll get through this part at least. <clears throat> now again, this is being explained 550 years even before Jesus sets foot on this earth. Verse 13. I kept looking in the night visions. And behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like the Son of Man coming. And he came up to the Ancient of Days. That would be God. And he was pre presented before him. This sounds like the early part of the revelation where Jesus comes before God. Verse 14. And to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom. That all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. He, his dominion, is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away. And his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. We're talking about the kingdom of God, the kingdom that Jesus rules. Uh, come on down, verse 16. I approached one of those who were standing by and began asking him the exact meaning of all of this. So he told me and made known to me the interpretation of these things. Did that happen in Daniel too? What do these things mean? And he's told. Verse 17. This, these great beasts, which are four in number, are four kings who will arise from the earth. But the saints of the highest one will receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever for all ages to come. What about this eternal kingdom? Who's going to be a part of it? Saints. Verse 19. Then I desired to know the exact meaning of the fourth beast, which was different from all the others, exceedingly dreadful, with its teeth of iron and with its claws of bronze, and which will devour, crush, and trample down the remainder with its feet. And the meaning of the ten horns that were on its head, and the other horn which came up before, uh, uh, which came up, excuse me, and before which the three of them fell, namely that horn which had eyes and a mouth uttering great bows, and which was larger in appearance than its associates. 
I want to know. And we're going to stop with the meaning right there so we can take up next week. We're going to get the meaning of this fourth one. That's who, that's who Daniel is focused on and, and concerned about. Babylon might be ruling at the writing of this book. But that's not what Daniel's concerned about. Okay. Bring your papers back next week. We'll get into those. Thank you all.